here. There we go. One, two, three. Um, I've been praying about and thinking about what I want to do as the uh, as we get things going on with uh, September and meals and all those good things. And I, I've got some good ideas. And also, I kind of just wanted to end our, our summertime uh, with this message: How to win the battles of life. How to win the battles of life. And, you know, you think about it, we all go through various battles. Um, we, we go through some that are minor. How many of y'all battled traffic in the last uh, couple of weeks? Anybody that's in Hillsborough knows this. Anybody that's in Durham, Raleigh, anywhere. Um, we all, we, we have little battles that go on. We have big battles. Health concerns, cancer, the loss of loved ones, financial crisis, job uh, displacement. Um, there could be crisis at, at schools. There can be crisis even as we um, we heard just this week uh, about the the tragedy that happened at UNC. Um, there are there are battles that we face, and so many of those students um, now go through that trauma. There are battles that we face in life, but the question is, how do we how do we face them, and how do we win them? One of the metaphors that the Bible uses over and over again in the Christian life is that uh, life is a battle. Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. This is talking about the battles that are daily in life. And here in the Old Testament, we see King Jehoshaphat. Um, we, we don't really study that much about Jehoshaphat, but we do know that name because, you know, we can use it as an exclamation. He is king in Israel, and he gets word that three enemy nations are coming to take them over. They are going to be at war, and they are going to be destroyed. And the Bible tells us of how the king won the battle. Granted, God is the one that won the battle, but it showed the right things that Jehoshaphat did in the midst of the battle, in the midst of this struggle. Look with me, 2 Chronicles 20, verses 1 and 2. It says, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Minyanites, uh, uh, came against Jehoshaphat for the battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and from beyond, beyond uh, and from behold, uh, they are in uh, Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. God puts Jehoshaphat here, and he put this in the Word of God to show us how a battle was won. And from that, we can draw out some amazing principles about winning the battle. The first is this, identify your enemy. Identify your enemy. Your enemy. Verse number one shows the first principle in overcoming the battles, and that is identifying your enemy. And you know, this seems like a rather obvious principle. You know what? Sometimes it's a harder thing to do. Many people today simply don't know who their enemy is. Or rather, maybe they point out everything else but what the real enemy is. Um, there is a, a YouTube guy that I, is doing a really good work in uh, the Texas area. He's a financial planner. And he will get people on this little kind of talk show, and he'll evaluate their, um, he'll evaluate their finances, and he'll get some people that are pretty bad off. Um, it might be a person that's making okay money, but boy, they just got a spending habit. They're going and they're spending money left and right. It might be on Wendy's. It might be um, on uh, expensive dinners or on travel or bad decisions on what they've gotten in the car. 
And he goes in and he just calls them out. And he says, listen, your problem is not that you're not making enough money. Your problem is you're spending all your money and you're in debt. A lot of times we don't want to deal with the actual problem. So another, you can tell what I did on vacation, watch YouTube. Um, there was a plumber did a little video that showed how a lady kept having a, a, a drain that was clogged. She'd call a plumber, plumber would come out, come, you know, do the plunging thing, and it would drain. And then like a week or so later, it'd get clogged up again, do the same thing. Finally called a different plumber, and the plumber said, hey, what did the guy see when he ran a camera down into the pipe? And, and the lady was like, well, I, I, she never run, ran a camera down in there. He's like, what? No, no, no. They like, would snake it and, and do that, and, and the drain would go, and then they'd leave. He ran the camera down in there, and he saw this huge, big old glob of grease and hair and all of this stuff. One plumber was going in and just making a hole in it. Water would drain down, but eventually it clogged back up. This guy saw the problem. He went in and, and did everything, and he, he broke up that and got everything flowing and everything clean. He fixed the problem. The question we have to ask ourselves is how good are we at knowing who the real enemy is? By the way, in our life and in our battles, who is the enemy a lot of the time? Yes, I'm the problem. I know that sounds like a Taylor Swift talk song, but <laughs> it's true. It? It's like, I'm, I'm the problem. Lord, I'm the one that's in denial. I'm the one that's causing my problems. I'm, you know, we like to blame everything. You know, I stuck my toe. Well, it was the step's fault. The step shouldn't have been there. Um... One day, uh, Grace was like three years old, and uh, she had gotten a set of crayons from my sister. My sister's really good at giving uh, really nice gifts. She gave her a set of Melissa and Doug triangular crayons. Um, I don't know, anybody ever seen those before? Those are the hardest substance known to man. You can scratch diamonds with these things. Grace had left one out, and I did not turn the light on when I went out to the living room one time, and I stepped on that thing. And my foot in that crayon had a nice little debate on which was going to break first. Thankfully, my foot did not break first, but boy, it hurt. Now, whose fault was it? Well, the crayon shouldn't have been left out, but she was three. I should have turned a light on. A lot of times, the battle is that we have to identify what the real problem is. Notice also number two. Number two, don't be driven by emotion. Don't be driven by emotion. Look at what uh, 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 3 says. It says, Jehoshaphat was afraid. Now, here's the deal. If you are the leader of a nation... And you know that three forces are coming to wipe you off the face of the earth. Fear is a logical thing to have. There is no reason in this world why you shouldn't have fear. But there's a step beyond that. Emotion is a wonderful and a great thing, but we aren't meant to be controlled by it. James 1, verse 19 and 20. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 2 Timothy 1, and verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. All of us are emotional beings. And what a beautiful thing it is. How would y'all like to not have emotion? You don't have happiness. You don't have sadness. You don't have a discouragement. You don't have elation. You don't have joy. You don't have anything. Everything's just mono. That'd be boring. It's all good out, wouldn't it? 
That'd be like just eating rice for the rest of your life and not having any salt, any butter, any soy sauce, any nothing on it, just bland as bland can be. God gave us emotion to make life joyful, to make life colorful, to make life uh, just a joy to be around. But here's the thing. God never intended emotion to be what drug us around everywhere. Uh, just wondering, because I know it's not me, who has had the biggest dog up here? It ain't me. The biggest dog we've ever had is a chihuahua. <laughs> if we win, that don't say good things. Anybody had like a 50-pound dog before? 50-ish? Okay, lab, Labrador. Anything bigger than Labrador? Holly? Okay, we got we got two competing here. No lab. I was hoping somebody would say I had a mastiff or great dane or something like that. I've uh, I've played with many a good Labrador and some good. I saw two gorgeous collies at the beach when I was out walking. I don't know how they survived with all that hair out there, but you ever had a, a Labrador or collie or a big dog on a leash? Now, dog on a leash is great. For, for us, when we first got our chihuahua, our leash was a piece of yarn. That's all we needed. We could have picked the dog up with the leash. It would not break. We were fine. Labrador, you need something a little bit more substantial than that. Um, You have a dog on a leash, and you leave the dog, that's good. It's kind of bad if the dog is pulling you along, right? You, you end up in some bad spots. You've, got, you've probably seen some videos of little kids that yay big, and they've got the little dog leash, and boom, they take off. The kids just like surfing after that. That's the idea of emotion. Emotion, many a time, is great. You know what? It's not meant to lead us. Jehoshaphat was in a position of power, and if he had let that fear lead him, he would have led him to a bad place. He'd been screaming out, Oh, run! Run for the hills! Go! And the nation would have fallen. But he didn't do that. He did number three. Take your problems to, your, to the Lord. Take your problems to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 3. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face, to seek the Lord and proclaim to fast throughout all Judah. When Jehoshaphat heard, yeah, he, he had the emotion, but then he said this, yes, you know what? I know what I've got to do. He called on all of the people saying, listen, we're all in this together. There's a fast that is called. We're called to fast and pray and say, Lord, we need some help. We need some help. We need you to, to come and we need you to, to do a great work and defend us and give us the victory. He set his face on the Lord. That means his, his, his face, his focus, everything was on God. And he went before the Lord and he prayed. And, and the prayer is there in, in basically in verses 6 through 12. And, and let me give you a synopsis of this. He says, God, look, in the past you helped us. And therefore I know you can help us now. And, and I'm asking, please help us. Take care of our enemies because, look, we can't do it. We ain't got any power. I can't overcome it. This is all in your hands, God. I'm just, I've got to give it all over to you. That's the idea of, of taking everything over to God. Here's one of the things a lot of times we don't like doing. We don't like giving all of it up. We, we don't like giving everything over. Um, I, I, I face this when my mom comes over to cook. I love my mother. My mother is a really, really good cook. I, I love her to death. And she is one of the very few people on this planet that can kick me out of my kitchen. <laughs> and that's basically what she does. Uh, if she comes over to cook for dinner or lunch or something like that or um, Christmas time or something like that, 
It should be coming in, and I don't get to go in there. I, I got to go in and get a, like a glass of water and stuff like that. But I'm like, okay, what can I do? Like, no, you can't do nothing. And it's difficult for me to go, okay, mom, I know you can do it. I want to help. But a lot of times, that's what we got to do. God, it's, it's out of my hands, and it's in to yours. He gave the problem over to the Lord. But notice also this. Number four is admit you need help. Admit you need help. Notice what Jehoshaphat said in verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great war that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jehoshaphat said, I got a problem, God, and, and I need help. He said one of the things that you and I and everybody else don't want to ever say, I need help. Because a lot of times we don't like doing that. You know, it could be we are knee-deep in mud and sinking fast, and somebody comes up to us, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. How many of y'all have ever been guilty of saying, oh, I'm fine when you're not? That's everyone that because we don't want to seem weak we don't want to seem like we have any problems but the reality is God desperately wants us to come to him and say I need help how many of y'all have ever helped a grandchild when it says hey I, I need your help with something how many of y'all have ever done that it doesn't matter anything kitchen or or on a car or anything like that. Anybody ever done that before? I've, I've known my grandparents like umpteen different times. Did that bring you joy or sorrow when they did that? Oh, but please don't say sorrow. Because <laughs> you get to help them. It's like, woohoo! I get to be a you know, grandparent. I get to do those things. I came to my grandfather, I don't know how many times, with, with school products. Stuff to make, and I, oh my good, I can't even think all the stuff that he helped me make. And I'm understanding it more now when Grace comes to me. Daddy, I need your help. I, she had to, in, I think it was eighth grade, she had to make a, um, uh, a mousetrap car. Anybody ever done that? It's a little car, and you use a mousetrap to, to make it go, and it's like a drag racer and all that. Oh, you talk about joy. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, we just get to use household items? Nothing was off limits. I'm thinking Allison was like, don't you tear that up. <laughs> um, we, we went to town on that. She figured out what two bond epoxy was. Um, we, we had fun. She didn't win, but that was because I didn't know about rat traps then. But um, we, we had fun. You ever think God is up in heaven? looking down at us going you have got problems i see it coming in from this side and from this side and from this side and i'm here you are my precious creation i want to help you i want to pour out goodness upon you i want to bring you through this call out to me call out to me for that help James 4 and verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Don't forget that when we call out, that is something God desperately wants us to do. Uh, number five is this. Rely on God's power. Rely on God's power. Verse 12 says this. Lord, I don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. The fifth principle in overcoming life's battles is to rely on God's power. We've got to get our eyes off of the Lord, or we've got to get our eyes on the Lord and off the largeness of our problems. Too often we've got our eyes on everything else except the one who can solve 
our problems. You think about that. Um, how many of y'all have ever had to use a, a magnifying glass before? Oh, I got, I got mine. There's a reason why this is that high up, so I can see it, because all the other podiums are not adjustable, and they're way down there for some reason. When we use something, a magnifying glass, it makes it, so whatever we're looking at, is a lot bigger. By the way, I know Christmas is coming. Um, anybody that's got a, a grandchild that is uh, in the elementary school age, or if you want to get a, a really cool gift to an elementary school student, there are little bitty microscopes you can get that are about this big, that cost about $12, $15. And I'll tell you what, you give them to fifth graders, and they go crazy. Because they go in and look at everything under the sun. So just, just let me know if you want to stop and stuff or I can hook you up. A lot of times we, we look at things. Man, they're huge. How big is stuff compared to God? Astronauts come and when they, when they come back from being in space, especially those that were on the moon, I believe it was Neil Armstrong, and I cannot remember, it might have been another one. He had this idea, and he says, you know what, I wish I could get every politician on the planet on the moon. Because when you see the Earth from the moon, it's a whole different perspective. There are no borders on, on the moon. You can see water, and you can see land, and you can see clouds. He says, but that's the earth. That's every place we leave. When we think about it, God looks at our problems that we see as such huge, big, massive things. He goes, you know what? That's not even that big for me. So what did they do? Jehoshaphat said, listen, God, we're relying on you. Our strength, our might, we can't do it. But you can. Number six is this. Relax in faith. Relax in faith. Verse 15. And he said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great war. For the battle is not yours, but God. What was the message from God? That doesn't belong to you anymore. This is God's. The problem doesn't belong to you anymore. It's God's. So many Christians today are totally worn out because they're trying to fight a battle that isn't theirs, but God's. When we go before the Lord and we give Him the problem, we've got to remind ourselves that he is the one that is in control. Um, <clears throat> um, how many times has this happened? How many times have you thought about this? God, I'm so sorry. I have let you down. Anybody ever thought that before? God, I've let you down. I mean, it's points in time people think that. You ever thought about this? We can't let God down because we never held God up. We don't hold up God. He holds us up. God, we've heard the saying, God helps those who help themselves. The truth of the matter is God helps those who can't even help themselves. We try and we do our best, but we understand God is the one that is going to get us through. John 15 and verse 5 reminds us, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. God desires us to relax in faith and let him work through us. 
Paul says it this way in Colossians 2 and verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In other words, just the way you became a believer, be sure you live the Christian life the same way, by simply trusting him all the way. You know what? I'll be honest. That's the hardest lesson right there. That's the hardest lesson. I mean, y'all have ever dropped your uh, car off at the mechanic before? I mean, y'all like dropping your car off at the mechanic. I don't like doing that because I know at the end of it I got to pay. Whenever I go, I get a little, I get a little bit uh, temperamental because it's my car, and I like clean everything out of the car. Because I don't want any of those technicians going through any of the stuff that's in my car. That's my car. That's my used bubblegum packet. I don't want you messing with that. <laughs> Take that thing out. But the idea is, it's mine. I want that control. Even though they're going to be the ones popping the trunk or popping the hood and doing stuff that I could never hope to do. It's a hard lesson because control is something that's so hard for us to give up. But when we do, when we find that, we find there's a peace. We find out God does everything just fine. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed tomorrow. Go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Finally this, and I'll be done. Number seven is thank God in advance. Thank God in advance. The story of Jehoshaphat is, is, is fascinating because of the way in which the battle was won. But we see this here, that there was a thanking of God in advance. Um. We, we see this. Nah, I'm not going to go in. Y'all can read about the battle and how it was won. And it was all of God. It was, it was all of Him. It wasn't on the might of the people. It wasn't the might of, of sword, but it was the might of God. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were three days in taking the spoil. It was so much. God gave them this amazing victory. You know what was happening? It was God, you, you already said what you were going to do. Thank you in advance. You ever thought about this? We can thank God in advance for salvation that we haven't realized because we're not in heaven yet. But we can thank God for a place in heaven because we've got it good as anything. We just aren't there yet. We can thank God in advance because we know tomorrow morning, wherever we might be, God's going to be there. When we face a battle, when we face those struggles in life, let us not forget, we, we can always thank God and go, you know what, God, the battle is all yours. And I know you're going to get me through it. And for that, we can have that thing. Questions, comments, observations. Daniel, I'm old. 29 years in Taiwan. Verse 12 was our was our verse of the day. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Because we didn't have a clue what we were doing. <laughs> but, um, and another thing, too, just about thanking God in advance. I remember one time Janet was sick. And I don't remember if it was, I think it was Joshua, uh, my son. I said, thank you, Lord, for making mommy better. Oh wow! That is, you know what? It's so much. So much teaching is out of the mouth of babes. That there is such great truth in that. To be able to thank in advance that God is going to be there and, and do those things. One other thing, I hope tonight that we won't say verse twelve. We are powerless. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. But we we do have power. <laughs> Hopefully. We do have power. There are times, though, we've got to admit, God, I'm weak. And this is a situation because a lot of times 
we do have those situations that are just so overwhelming. A lot of times we got to step back a little bit and go, okay, God, I got to trust you in it. I got to move forward with you, but I got to trust you in it. Because um, a lot of times, how many of y'all know the uh, the song, uh, The Touch of the Master's Hand with the violin? You know that one? Um, I, has Allison ever sung that? I don't think I've sung it. Um, but it's, uh, it's, talks at the very beginning, it's, it's a ballad, and there's a, um, an auctioneer that is uh, going, and, and the auction's about ready to end, and there is, uh, there's one last thing on the, on, the, on the docket, and it's this old violin. It's all messed up, just doesn't look all that great, and the, um, the guy, you know, holds it up, and he says, one, who, who give me one dollar? Who give me two? Two dollars? Who'll make it three? Three dollars twice? That's a good price for this violin. And then there was an old man that came up from the crowd. And he took the old violin and he, he piddled with the strings. And then he played a beautiful tune on it. And the auctioneer, he, he set the violin down. And he sat down. The auctioneer picked the violin up. He says, one, who'll give me 1,000? Who'll give me two? 2,000, who'll give me three? 3,000 twice, that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? The people looked and said, we don't understand. And he said, what made the difference? And the auctioneer said, the touch of the master's hand. That's the, that's the idea that God, when, when God gets a hold of something, everything changes. Any other comments? Yes? I, I forgot, but can Claire remember um, well, Trent and Amy and the boys were supposed to leave for the beach tomorrow, um, but Levi had some wounds from playing football, and they've gotten infected, and so they're treating for MRSA. Oh, but he hasn't, he hasn't, the test results have not come back yet. Okay. So he may not have that, I hope. But, um, yeah, yeah, I have not either. That's, uh, wow. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, that's Memorial Day weekend. I know many will be traveling, and um, I do hope. Uh, I hope it's not that. I hope whatever he's taking there, it will knock it out. Well, let's bow in a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll go ahead and head on. Father, Lord, as we, we go before you tonight, we pray now for, um, for our journey as we go forth. Help us in our battles. We know we face them. But, Lord, with you on our side, we know all battles can be won. Lord, we want to lift up Trent and Amy and the boys as, as they're planning to go off on this trip. I pray now that um, I would be well. Um, Levi is as he's had his wounds and, and all and I pray everything would be alright um, I pray that, that uh, everything would heal up quickly Father we lift up also the UNC students um, the faculty, the staff all those that have been affected um, by, this, by this terrible tragedy um, Father help them and, and guide and direct them through it. Lord dismiss us now with your blessings. I pray that you would give us safety in our journeys that again we might come together to worship you for it's in your precious and holy name we pray Thank y'all so much for this and...